now. Hello, <laughs> my name is Alyssa Rosen, and you're listening to the Life Plus God podcast. Welcome. Hold on, let me blow my nose. <laughs> Gross. Um, I'm here with my co-host, Aaron Willis. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Alyssa. <laughs> and we are doing the podcast a little differently today. Normally, we get to sit side by side in the studio and have a nice little conversation over some coffee or Mountain Dew. Mm-hmm. Uh, but today, I'm having a little bit of a COVID scare. So we are each in our own homes recording separately. But the beauty of technology is that we can still have a lovely conversation. So today, we are talking about purpose and passion. Of course, a great topic for the new year as everybody's making those New Year's resolutions. Aaron, do you do New Year's resolutions? Uh, Well, two things. Number one, I thought this episode was about dinosaurs, so my bad. And number two... Well, well, I understand that is your passion, so... (laughs) Is it not just a universal passion? Don't we all love dinosaurs? They're super cool. Um... Uh, so I have done New Year's resolutions in the past. Um, the beauty of of me is that uh, it they they've I've never kept a New Year's resolution because I forget things like super super duper often, and so uh, the the pressure of the world to say like, hey, this arbitrary date that like like the Gregorians decided a long time ago, this is where I'm going to start doing the right things. It's like, no, that's not going to happen. Yeah. I've never liked New Year's resolutions either. And I've always been the person who's like, well, if you want to do something, just do it now. Right. Just do it now. Yeah. But I also this year, it's not like a specific resolution, Uh but one of the things that I guess it's like an overall focus and theme for me is like, just, take care of your mental health because (laughs) I really uh, let myself go, I guess you could say, in 2021. That's the way people say it with their weight gain or whatever. When it comes to mental health, I just really let myself go. Right. And so in 2022, I want to do a better job of that. So I'm trying to drink more water and go for walks and take more breaks and do things for me and stop putting so much pressure on myself. So it's not so it's probably not going to work at all because goals you're supposed to have specific things but wow. mine's just like do better on mental health. I, but see I like that for for me it's like there's there's a there's a freedom in that. And that's uh, honestly if I do have a goal for 2022 it is to do better on my mental health and I literally got all my uh all my meds up to at my appointment this morning. So it's like I'm on my way. I'm doing good. Yay. Uh, oh my gosh, you are already keeping your New Year's resolution. No, but I that you didn't even know you had. Now you have it. Yes. And you've already been doing it. I know. I mean, I haven't gotten the the prescription filled. That's I'm fantastic. gonna forget to do that, but you know. Well, hey, celebrate the tiny victories. <clears throat> it's the thought that counts, right? Um, and so uh Yeah, well, eh. I I think the <laughs> I mean, take your medication. Oh, okay. But... All right. Well, fair enough. <laughs> um that's what everybody keeps saying over and over all the time to me, Aaron. <laughs> uh, anyway, no, I think the way that you're doing it is really smart because I think part of the problem for me is like you set this thing in your mind and you have no idea necessarily what it's going to take to accomplish that. And it's like um, – and so it's like, you know, I'm going to drink – I'm going to drink a gallon of water a day and I'm going to walk two miles a day. And then it's like, okay, well, well, you know, what happens if you get called into work earlier? Don't do yeah, that. Yeah, or what happens yeah. if you leave your giant water jug at home, dumb dumb? Like, what are you going to do then? And it's just like, so for me, it's like, yeah, hey, why don't you, I know a lot of times for me, it's easier to stop doing something that I know is not great for me than it is to start doing the good thing. And so it's like, hey, maybe... Just get the single cheeseburger this time, big guy, and not the yeah. double. Um, 
Well, and that's a big thing is like one little step at a time. Right. Don't be too hard on yourself. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. Yeah. But like, yeah, maybe when you go to a restaurant, order water instead of that diet yeah. coke or whatever it is you normally drink. And um, and fun life hack. If you get this single cheeseburger, you can eat two of them. So. Wow. <laughs> That is not recommended by the Life Plus God podcast. So I cannot endorse that message. Very true. Uh, I also... No, but so our theme... (laughs) I'm trying to segue into what we're actually supposed to be talking about, Aaron. You're doing a great job, by the way. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) So our theme for this month... Oh, no, my headset fell out. Here we go. Okay. Our theme for this month uh, at Church Memorial United Methodist Church, which is, which is the church that we're podcasting out of, uh, our worship series is called Why Am I Here? Why am I here? Why am I here? And I feel like all of us at some point in our lives, whether literally or metaphorically, <laughs> are asking ourselves that question. Why am I here? And I find it really interesting. And so, like, I don't want to just default to the churchy answer of, like, uh, which I might get in trouble from our pastors because I think that's a lot of what we're talking about in worship is, like, well, why I'm here is to love God and to serve God and to love others and to serve others. And, yes, that's true, (laughs) but... (laughs) But I do get caught up in what is my individual purpose? What are my individual passions? Mm -hmm. Um, Because we live in Western society where it's all about me, all about the individual. We're not really looking as much on a societal level. And so I just wanted to have a conversation around like what purpose and passion really means to you. My first question is, what what were you taught as a kid about passion and purpose? Gen Xer, give me a, a generational oh breakdown. What what were what was, did your parents tell you about passion and purpose? I was literally talking to my father about this the other day because, you know, my my dad uh, has always been incredibly supportive of my uh, my my music stuff. And, you know, my mom, I, I lived with my mom primarily from the time I was five. That's when my parents got divorced. So I think my mom got to see my everyday, like, uh, you know, ADHD kind of all over the map. Um, whereas when I had more downtime, I definitely gra- gravitated towards music more often. And so my dad was always very supportive of me doing music and was always kind of the first one to be like, well... I'm I I'm like I want a guitar and he's like okay do you know how to play the guitar I'm like no he's like do you want guitar lessons first no did okay you just you just want me to buy you a musical instrument and then you're just going to figure out how to do it yes he's like okay let's see and and then he would do it and then that's what I would do I would figure out how to how to play it and um I literally was talking to him about this right before Christmas. And I said, why did you do that? <laughs> why did you decide to do that? And he was like, um, he was like, uh, my dad really loves music. And he he's a, a very creative person. He's a very intelligent and creative person. And um, yeah, all really, all of my family loves music. But I, I think my dad would have done something different. And I think uh, he was like, he said, you know, when I was young, being a musician wasn't really an option as a career. But he's like, but then I was listening to music on the radio all the time. He's like, it it didn't make sense. It's like nobody I knew was going to go be a musician. That was just that was a stupid, like throwing your life away kind of a thing. And yet, you know, (laughs) people are paying you know, literally $10 for a concert ticket back then, uh, you know, just, I think that was three weeks pay back then. I really don't know what the inflation rate was back then, but he's like, so when you wanted to do it, I was like, well, 
let him try. And if he's good at it, he'll be good at it. And if he's not, he's not. And he, you know, I mean, he watched me play little league. He knew I wasn't going to be a baseball player. So it's like, maybe this will it's like, maybe this kid is creative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah maybe this will stick uh, because uh, the sport's not really for him. So, uh, so I think I got kind of an atypical, um, uh, kind of upbringing from that, that standpoint where, uh, you know, I still had a lot of focus on like, what was my career going to be? If I was going to be doing music, what was my career going to be? And then when I got into college and I started, you know, taking music courses, they're like, what do you want to do with a bachelor's of music? And I'm like, I, I want to make music. And they're like, well, just go do that. This is so you can become a band director or something. It's like, oh, I don't want to do that. That I don't want to work with kids. I, I made <laughs> I made fun of the, those people uh, back then. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I kind of wound up uh, getting out, and uh, I just completely sidestepped into computers and IT for a long time. And then I got an opportunity to make music, and uh, everybody, including my wife at the time, was really supportive of me. But I didn't really have any hesitation of there being like, you know, what what are you doing with your life? You know, everybody was kind of like, this makes sense for you. Uh, and maybe that's because I was just awful at school. I don't I don't really know where they're like, yeah, sing your songs, buddy. You can you got this. Like, <laughs> I don't really know if if that's what it was. Yeah, I I think that we were very different kids, like very different personality types. Yeah. You and I were probably very different kids. Probably. Um, probably. Because I'll say like, can we put I, money on that? I was, I was the opposite of you of like, I was a go getter. Yeah. Like everything I did, I would jump into something. And then within a week, I would be the leader of that thing. Like whatever group I was in, uh-huh. I would become the leader of that group. I would be really good at, maybe I wasn't a natural at it, uh-huh. but I would work so hard and get really good at it to where I could be good at just about anything that I threw myself into. Um, and I had this idea that in college and everything of like, if you're not achieving, and it's kind of like the Western view of success, right? Of like, it's about being ambitious. It's about looking towards what's next. It's about climbing the corporate ladder. You got to get your hustle on. You got to, you know, network. You got to do all of these things. And so I was kind of like, okay, that's what you got to do to survive in this mm-hmm. world. You, you got to get out there. You got to get after it. Um, put everything you have into it, be a leader. If you're not a leader, then it's not worth doing. Like I had this thought in my head and then there were also like these sayings that people would have of like, do what you love and you never work a day in your life. And I'm like, bullshit. Right. Because (laughs) no matter how much you love what you do, you're not going to love every day of the job. It's not going to be every detail of everything that you're doing. You're just like, I'm ecstatic, you know? And so I quickly learned in my first job out of college, that was an unrealistic expectation Because what I found is that like I was working in marketing, I was climbing the ladder, I was being very successful, I was being rewarded with big accounts, I was being trusted with a lot of money and strategy and on all of these things. I was working my way up, I was a director in the agency by the age of 24. And I was miserable. Mm. I was absolutely miserable. Like I didn't have any friends outside of work. I was working at least 60 hours every week. I was Good grief. Um, not spending a lot of time with my family. I, you know, so basically I just had prestige and money, but like no relationships mm-hmm. whatsoever. And the relationships that I did have weren't healthy. They were centered around drinking or they were centered around, you know, going out and doing something expensive or whatever it is. And um, I started to like think, why do I have to be ambitious? Like, why is that considered a successful trait? Like, can't I just enjoy working in a nine to five job and go home at the end of the day and just like make enough money to live off of 
and actually get to have friendships and have good relationships with my family and all of these things. And it took me a long time. So, you know, I went from working at a marketing agency to working at a church and which is so like, it was a culture shock <laughs> for me going I because I, and, and I still get like a little bit of, um, jabbing from the people at the church because I do have a tendency to be more cutthroat. I'm more bottom line. I'm less like, I don't really take emotions and feelings into consideration when making decisions uh, because I still have very much have like a corporate mindset uh-huh. and that, I think that's my dog scratching. Sorry if you can hear that. I can't. Raquel, chill. <laughs> um, so I still kind of have that lingering corporate mindset, but I'll say when I first transitioned from working at an agency to working at a mm-hmm. church, when people asked me what I did, I was embarrassed mm-hmm. to say I work at a church yep. because I felt like they would make all of these assumptions back about me like, oh, she couldn't hack it in the real world or she isn't ambitious. She doesn't care about growing her career. She doesn't care about getting to the next level and, you know, all of these things. And so when, when I would introduce myself and of course the first question everyone asks is, what do you do? I would say, oh, I'm in marketing. And that's all I would say. And they were like, oh, where do you work? And then I was like, oh, now I have to tell them I work at a church and they're going to think I'm a failure and that I couldn't make it and that I'm not ambitious and that I'm just a little church lady. (laughs) And like, (laughs) and I carried, I know I carried all of this, um, all because I had put, like, I had kind of had this warped view of what it is to live your passion and live your purpose. And I equated it with corporate success Mm -hmm. is what it looks like to live into your purpose and live into your passion. And, um, I, a lot of it was the messaging I received as a kid of like, yes, I'm a millennial snowflake. Yes. My parents told me you can do anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to be. You follow your passions Uh, God has a plan for you and you're going to do incredible things. And I was so deeply encouraged as a kid and I was like, yeah, I can do anything. But that mixed in with like my natural go-getter leadership mentality just created this stew pot of feeling like if I'm not achieving, if I'm not constantly seeking after what's next, then I'm not living with passion. And it means that it took me a long time to learn how to be content. Yeah. Which I think is true, true uh, happiness yeah. is being content with what you have and where you are rather than looking towards what you don't have and where you want to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's a, that's a big change that's happened for me around purpose and passion and now if people ask me what my passion is or like what I feel like my purpose is or in church lingo they say oh what's your calling like what's God calling you to do I don't know like I really don't know I'm kind of just like trying to shed all of my old understandings around passion and purpose so that I can be open to things that the world presents to me. But I'm still in that process of like shedding the old. Yeah. I think, you know, uh, even when you say like, what's your calling? Like it, it, like it makes me like, like I, I get, I get really tense because it's like, uh, uh, it's it's like the it's like the question of what do you want to do with your life except if you answer it wrong you're going to disappoint the lord. It's like, oh, that's just worse. It's like <laughs> you know, <laughs> when people ask me what I wanted to do when I was 18, I was like I I don't know. Go back to sleep. That's what, <laughs> that's what I want to yeah. do right now. I There's some Doritos calling yeah, my name. I have I have a PlayStation <laughs> 1 and a guitar amp in my room. Like I don't I don't want to do anything but those two things. That's a, that's all I want to do for the rest of my life. Um and luckily, you know, that changed. I there there are other things that I that I like to do, but like even, you know, right now as I uh am looking for full-time employment, like there's something that I have wanted to do since I lost my job at the end of 2019. 
and I have not done it because are you going to put it out into the universe right now? Sure. Yeah. What you want to do? Yeah, I, I'm going yeah. to. I, I'm actually going to. Uh, and it's it's very it's very uh, very uh, uh, out of sorts for the kind of stuff that I normally do. Uh, I want to learn how to and potentially just make my own candles. It's a weird thing. Uh, but I had, a that I, that is, I am, I, of all of the things that you could have said, I am at a, I did not expect I know. that at all. I know. That's amazing. I know. I had, uh, I had an aunt, uh, she was my great aunt and she used to make these candles every year and she would, she would find, she would go to like antique stores and yard sales and all this kind of stuff. She lived up in Oklahoma and she actually worked at a, like a youth camp for all of her life. She was like a, a camp counselor leader type thing her entire life. But she would find all these weird bottles and jars and vases and stuff like that. And she would make these really cool candles in them. I've always just been like, man, I really want to do that. And I've looked into it like 30 times and just never pulled the trigger because it's like, I need I need to be doing something with my life. And it's like, well, what if that thing is making candles? I don't know. But there's always that so hesitation. Why, so why does that I, I wanna go back to that thought you have of like, well, I need to be doing something with my yeah. life. Where does that come from? Because I have that too. Maybe all of humanity has that. But like where does that come from? Well, I think for for me, um, because I, I can really only speak for myself. Um, and as empathetic as I am, you know, I, the, I, I'm learning that a lot of times we as people come to similar conclusions, whether that is kind of presupposed for us by society or uh, whether it's just kind of how human beings are. Uh, but <clears throat> I, I think we all kind of get there in different ways. So I don't know, necessarily know the impetus for everyone else, but you know, I, I know for me, I, you know, went from like d d doing this in my career, like, you know, constantly get moving up, 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 up and, and you know, l leaving a job, you know, adding responsibility, doing this or that and the other. And, um, you know, all, all the while kind of uh, while those responsibilities were increasing, you know, increasing my income and everything like that. And then, you know. I the the company I work for shuts down and then the pandemic happens and it's it's literally just like it's the flat line just the do where like nothing's happening. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> and it, even now like there are musicians that I'm friends with and bands that I follow where they're they're people are starting to complain about my shows are getting canceled. I have comedian friends yeah. and voice actor friends and they're like my shows are getting canceled again. And so it's it's really hard for me to be in the music world as that stuff just keeps getting batted down. It's non-essential, absolutely. Like and it, you know, don't feel bad for me on that on that front. I I we need the people who are working at the grocery stores and keeping the supply chain going and like those those guys are the real thing. Like don't don't feel bad for me. But I feel bad for me a little bit. But we need our we no 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 <laughs> no. We need our artists too because they are the people who are bringing us joy during the hardest times of our life. The comedians are keeping us laughing yes. when every single day we feel like crying and breaking down. And music takes you to another plane. Like it I don't want Artists are essential. I will say yeah. that. Maybe gathering in mass groups for that artist isn't essential. Definitely not. But the work, <laughs> yeah, the work, I think. I don't want to discredit artists on no, here because uh, I, that is a big part of my mental health. <laughs> 2022, <laughs> take care of my mental health. Yes. Um, and a lot of it is like finding podcasts yeah. and things that like put me in a positive place. Yes. But I have, a, I have a question for you, and this might come off as, like, facetious or ingenuine, but it's not. Okay. Okay. Your father. Yes. My, I don't have kids. I don't plan on having kids. Okay. 
But my thought is, like, when you're a parent, aren't your kids, like, automatically little purpose machines? Like, you feel like you have a purpose and a passion because now you have a child that you are, like, raising into this world and they're going to outlive you and be your legacy and, and all of this stuff. Like, and this sounds like I'm being mean by asking, like, does your child give you purpose? Are you passionate about your child? But I'm not, like, <laughs> I'm, I'm really asking because I don't, that's something that I thought, like, oh, as a single uh, person without kids, like, I'll have to find my purpose elsewhere. Oh. Or is it just... Yeah, that's that's a really, uh, I, I understand why you're asking it now, and that's that's a really interesting question. Um, does my child give me purpose? Uh, I think from the standpoint of there are things that I am legally obligated to do for my child. Uh, yes, from that standpoint, uh, uh, th there, there is a purpose for my existence. Um, and uh, if we want to talk about that, you know, I'm the supposed to be the primary, uh, you know, primary income earner uh, in in our structure right now. That's what my role is because Destiny homeschools our daughter. Okay, but let me just say, I've never watched you parent, but based on stories that you tell me, you're selling yourself really short because I know you're going above and beyond what you legally have to do <laughs> well, as okay, a father. I'm getting there. You are a huge source of emotional support for your child. Yes. Yes, <laughs> you're making yourself sound awful, and you're not. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to a specific point. Uh, I, okay, I, okay. I think so. I, I think it, it's really very different. Um, and I don't really want to speak solely for my wife. She would be much better at doing that. <clears throat> I think for my wife, she always had that maternal instinct of I'm supposed to be a mom. <clears throat> and I think that that's incredible. I wanted to be a dad, <clears throat> but I always had some hesitation. And I think part of that is because, you know, I am ADHD and it's like, you know, I, not that I would not be a good father, but would I be a good enough father in those things that would equip my child, <clears throat> excuse me, to be a productive member of society down the road, I guess I should say. Mm -hmm. So I had that desire. I wouldn't say that I had that overwhelming urge to become a parent. Um, I wanted to be a parent, but it, I didn't feel like there was this force of like, I must. I must procreate yeah. and have progeny to live on and carry on my name. I, uh, my name means a lot to me, uh, but... Uh, in in 10 years time even if i do something to get my name on a building somewhere somebody will have to explain who i am and even the place that that we work has a man's name on it and i didn't know that until i went through the 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 uh the new members class i i, I had no idea and I think that it's I think that it's a very I think that it's a very neat story now that I know. But, you know, I don't have that like generational push for my name to for the Willis name to carry on. It just yeah. what I care more about is that my daughter is happy and fulfilled. That's really all that makes any difference to me. Well, and for those who are listening and, and don't know, he's we both work at Treach Memorial United Methodist Church, oh, yes. and it's called Treach Memorial because the land that the church is located on was farmland that was donated by the Treach family. Uh, so the church is named after them, and it's really hard to spell, Very, and nobody knows what it right. means when they come here, uh, but it's in memory of the people yeah. who donated the land. Um, so I think... Uh, to to kind of answer your question, you said something uh, that I hear a lot, uh, and it doesn't really it doesn't really necessarily make me happy to hear. Uh, you said that you're going to have to look for your purpose somewhere else. Um, I, I don't think uh, I think kids equate to purpose in some 
way, shape, and form. Um, I think for me, because we're talking about purpose and passion, I think that I've found throughout fatherhood that my child represents a lot more passion for me than she does purpose. Um, there's a lot more that I get to enjoy that I, that uh, I never thought I would get to enjoy ever again. Just even the, the silly thing of uh, this year at Halloween, this was the first year that I felt like my daughter was old enough to watch the movie Beetlejuice, which is one of my favorite movies. And so to, to get to experience that with her was uh, an amazing thing. And like hearing her laugh at the moments that I, that make me laugh and all that kind of good stuff. And it's, it's fantastic. So that's not a purpose. Uh, you are not uh, <laughs> commanded by any uh, entity legal or otherwise to watch Beetlejuice with your child. Uh, that's, that's a passionate thing that I get to do. And um, the older and older I get, I get to do more of those things. I want to get to like the more the more serious passion. So we kind of threw out the word calling a little bit and it makes Bleh. both of us cringe. Bleh. Yeah, a little cringe word. Yep. Um and I don't I don't know why it is. Uh, you you explained why you dislike the word calling. For me it's because I think that people have come to me and like told me their calling and I'm like I don't think that's your calling. <laughs> They're like, God is telling me that this church needs to do X. And I'm like, I don't think that God's telling me right. that. But then like you can't. So I feel like people's callings have been used as a weapon, which is oh, yeah. basically like God's telling me to do this. Are you saying that God is wrong? Get out of my way, right. you know? And and if it's an actual calling, I, I don't know. But I have never personally received a calling in like the traditional sense that we think of it. Maybe someone could like reach out to me and be like, "Oh no, we've been thinking about callings the wrong way yeah. this whole time." Because I I don't know. Like, ha have you received a calling where like you know that God has put you in a place to do a certain thing? Uh. <clears throat> I, you know, I don't, I don't think so. Um, and, and if, if he has, I think I'm probably just doing it the way that I feel the most comfortable. Um, but it, it, it goes kind of with, with one of the, the other questions that, that you, you, you know, you want to get to. Um, so I, I, I think I'll wait, but I, you know, I thought at one point that I that I was being called into youth ministry, and then I did it for a little while, and I was like, "No, this is not. <laughs> this isn't it. Uh, th this really, this really isn't what my calling is." Uh, and then I, I I stopped like going towards like being a youth pastor specifically, but I still worth, worked with youth for a long time. Uh, like assisting in, in youth departments and activities and, and all that kind of good stuff. <clears throat> and, and, you know, now I, I look back on that and um, it's like, I, I still feel called to help people who are kind of in this transitory phase of life because I feel like it was very tumultuous for me. And I'm just very lucky that I had people around me that were like, Hey, if you don't feel like you should go to college, you don't have to keep going to college. Because everybody else I knew at the time was going to college. <clears throat> I literally was the yeah. only person in my friend group that did not graduate college. And also, I was one of the only people in my friend group that didn't graduate with a bunch of debt that they had to pay off. I just started mm -hmm. working, and I had a big financial head start on life compared to a lot of people. Um, and it, it wasn't all bad. Now, a lot of those people have gone on to be vastly more successful maybe than I'll ever be in my life. So, you know, six, one, half dozen, the other probably. But <clears throat> if success equals money. Yeah. Well, it's, you, you know, it's not just that. I, you know, I, I, I have some people that uh, I'm not saying like, hey, kids, don't go to college because I'm not, I'm definitely not saying that. I'm saying that I think that other people have, um, have 
done a really good job, whether that was their passion or not, of, of fulfilling that kind of a um, chain of events, if you will. I, I think that they have they've gone through and not only have they done kind of what was expected of them, but they've either turned it into something that they really love or they've turned it into something that was very unexpected, whether they love it or not. And, they, and there's a, you know, there's a, a vast success. And then there were a lot of people I, that I went to school with that just wound up in jail. So that's when I'm like, hey, I'm not doing too bad. <laughs> like, uh, I, I, I did okay. I, you know, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not some, uh, you know, uh, nameless figure head at a company. And I'm, I'm also, you know, not, not, not incarcerated. So I, I'm doing something just completely mediocre and that's totally fine. <laughs> well, so I want to know where are, where do your passions and your faith intersect? Maybe it's not a calling, but I know like, you do some audio engineering yeah. for us at the church. Mm-hmm. And I know like tinkering with sound and and sound production is a passion of yours that now you've been able to use in a place of worship mm-hmm. and place of faith. So that's like an obvious intersection. But like where do you see faith and passion tying together for you? Well, that's one way. Um, you know, I I really love music and I, I love doing, you know, audio, video, media stuff. I, I definitely love that kind of a thing. But um, my, my passion really is uh, if, if, if I could wave a magic wand or uh, if I had infinite power for the day, um, uh, my, my desire would be to make everyone safe. Um, when you're safe, you're, you're not afraid, you're not anxious. Um, you can take a deep breath. I think you, you can plan when you're safe. I think that you can, uh, if you feel safe, I think you can focus on others. Um, and you don't get that luxury if you're not safe. Uh, and then I know from interpersonal relationships that, um, that a lot of the emotions that we feel boil down to safety. I think trust in a relationship equates to a level of safety. And I think that truly feeling loved equates to safety. And there are so many people and so many ways, myself included, that have areas of our life where we are not safe and uh that's everyone that's everybody everybody has it and i am wholeheartedly convinced that if even if everything in your life is going absolutely fine we will trick ourselves into not feeling safe by being like why why is it so quiet why is everything okay? What? What? And and that keeps people out of uh, people who have faced like uh, trauma or infidelity or abuse. That keeps them out of good relationships with people because they're waiting for that shoe to drop somewhere. Uh, people who uh, have financial insecurity, they wind up buying incredibly like inexpensive things like cheap like just think about like cheap backpacks and how quick they break down and and all this kind of stuff so really my passion would be and I'm not really good at figuring out how to do this for people but my passion would be that everybody feels safe even if that's just mm-hmm. a place where you can share the way that you feel e- even if that's it like that's what I really want for the world. And if I could figure out how to do that effectively for people with music, that would be great. But if it never involves music, I would way, way, way be, I would be way happier at figuring out. But you know what it could involve? Candles. (laughs) I'm being serious. 
I'm being serious. <laughs> like when I want to feel safe and cozy uh-huh. at home, uh-huh. lavender scented candle, something like the smell yeah. and the the fire and all of that, like it brings a safe feeling. I really think that if that's your passion and you're interested in like learning how to do the whole candle thing, there's a, there's an intersection there that maybe so. I don't know. Yeah. So I think for me, um, where my, where my passions intersect is that, um, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to say this, so I'm just going to say it. And if we need to edit it later, we can do that. Um, you know, I have been to um, not a lot of different churches, but I have denomination hopped before. And I, I, I have moved from church to church to church. I've moved from city to city. And I think one of the other things is in my old line of work, I wound up visiting a lot of churches Um you know, several dozen churches over the the 13 or 14 years that I worked there. And um, I think the, the, the point where my passion intersects my faith now is that um, I believe that at its heart, Treach wants that safety and that provision for people. Uh, I think really, I, I'll be really honest. I, I think this particular church, which is one of the reasons that I'm here, if I'm just being totally honest, and this is the part that you, you might not want in there, but, uh, I've been to a lot of churches that are so inwardly focused and everything is about bringing people in, making sure that we have all these programs to keep people, focused on the church, focused on their walk with God. And I really don't have a problem with any of that until it becomes your sole focus. And I have been to a few churches where that is their sole focus. And um, I think that that is really uh, uh, counterproductive to the, to the kingdom of God, if, if I'm being quite honest, um, because it's really easy for me to focus on myself every day. I'm in here with me every day. I I'm locked in here. I can't, I can't travel out of myself, unfortunately. And so, uh, finding, finding a, um, a spiritual experience that reflects that can make you feel very comfortable. And I'm specifically using that word instead of safe. Uh, it can make you feel very comfortable and, uh, comf- comfortability can be confused for safety and complacency can be yeah. easily confused for contentment. And, um, so, I uh, one of the, the main reason that I am at Treach is because, uh, I see Treach and, uh, doing it. And I believe that at its heart, Treach really wants to impact, those people who are disadvantaged and specifically those people who are unsafe in whatever form that is financial food, housing, uh, spiritually, um, mental health. Uh, We've had some very open and honest, uh, sermon series on mental health. And I think all of that is fantastic. And I think that there are uh, a lot of places where that's not happening. And so, uh, really working up there and, build trying to help continue to build treach as an entity to me is is part of where my faith collides with my passion and me being on this podcast is an attempt for me to amplify and find people that Specifically with you and me, people who have had maybe church experiences that have been really bad. Uh, I have had those experiences. I have been out there. And so this is it, Alyssa. I'm doing it right now to answer your question. Well, see, you stole mine because I was going to say this podcast for me is where well, you're the host. passion intersects. You should have you you said it first. <laughs> 
Well, you know, that's one of, so one of the things that I'm really passionate about, and it's also kind of like a silliness on, on my end of that. I'm just, I'm such a ridiculous person. Sometimes I can't do small talk. I'm not good at right. it. Like I can't do the, how's the weather is ever how nobody's getting sick. Are they like that sort of stuff? I go straight into depth uh -huh. and it freaks people yeah. out. Um, but in this podcast environment, I can do that. I can go straight into depths and be like, Hey, welcome. We're talking about purpose and passion. Tell me about like your entire life yeah. and like, give me all of the details and let's go really deep. And what does that mean for your relationship with God? And what does that mean for your family? And like, really ask deep questions that people are open to exploring that they wouldn't be if I just like walked up to them on a Sunday morning and was like, Hey, like, tell me all about your purpose. I just, like what, it, why are you here? I just see Alyssa like, why are you here? With her like reporter style <laughs> microphone, like Bob Barker, just pie eyed yeah. walking up to people in the church. Like, why are you here? Eh. And then just be like, but I love, I love digging into people's personal stories and personal experiences, getting a different perspective. And then also one of the things that I have the privilege doing on this podcast that not everybody in church world gets to do is I get to doubt openly yeah. and I get to ask questions openly and I get to question scripture openly yeah. and all of these things and it's encouraged and I just want anyone who's listening to know if they don't get anything out of these conversations at least start asking the questions and know that it's okay to ask questions. And it doesn't mean you have a weak faith. And it doesn't right. mean that you're displeasing to God. <laughs> and I believe that God smiles when we're pursuing knowledge and when we want to learn more and when we want to expand ourselves spiritually and we want to love better and all of these things. I think that God celebrates that. Um, but so often what I hear over and over again is people have been shut down and People will come up to me and, and, and say, you know what? You ask the questions I've always wanted to ask. You know, one of our segments on this podcast is a series called Unlearn mm -hmm. Faith, where I sit down one on one with one of our pastors, Doug Meyer, and we have a really blunt conversation about faith topics. And I'm like, well, I don't know if I believe that part of the Bible, or I don't know if you know we've been interpreting that the right mm -hmm. way or i don't agree with the way that this person has written this devotion it doesn't really make sense and and he is very patient with me and sometimes he disagrees with me and sometimes he's like hey you have a point yeah that's a little weird <laughs> and i think that for us to have the freedom to ask those questions i i my hope is obviously I get very animated when I'm passionate about something. Right. So like this is something I'm super passionate about. And I just want anyone listening to feel that freedom to ask those questions. And it's not cut and dry and it's not black and white. And there's not a right way and a wrong way to explore spirituality. Agreed. And specifically, ask us those questions. Like send us your questions. Yeah. Like let us know because uh, I like... I like asking questions, and they don't necessarily have to have an answer, but a lot of times questions are just a great way to think through something uh, from a different perspective, like you said. Sometimes I get that feeling of like, oh my gosh, I'm 33, like I, <laughs> am I, I'm heading into my midlife crisis, I guess, like I could be middle-aged, I don't know, but I'm heading into right. that range of becoming middle-aged, and you start to question, you know, what is my purpose? Why am I here? Like 20s were fun, but now it's time. Like adulting is real now. Like now it's for real. And <laughs> like the, I did the test run. I don't know how well I did, but they just kind of throw you into full adulthood and here you are. And uh, but at any point I can change. And yep. if I have the perseverance and the gumption to do it, I can do it. Like I can at any point change completely what I want to do. And there's some comfort in that. Of course, it would be very difficult and challenging yeah. and come with a lot of missteps and 
and all of that. But yeah, I think that's something that I just want to keep in the back of my head forever. And I do want to encourage you that you are definitely middle aged because you use the word gumption. Just, I know. just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been described as an old soul. Uh -huh. And so when you're described as an old soul when you're 13 and now you're 33, I don't know. Like, did my soul get older uh, or is my body just catching up to my soul? I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I think you're the bee's knees, Alyssa. I just think you're the you're the cat's pajamas. <laughs> Aw, thanks, Daddy-O. <laughs> oh my goodness uh oh man well this is a, not that we've come to any conclusions around purpose and passion and but i think that's kind of part of what i wanted to express today of like you don't have to have absolute answers oh, yeah. and like don't put too much pressure on yourself to be like okay why am i here what is my purpose i have to get my passions like does my career match with my passions and what if i don't like my job and what if you know all of these things and we just put so much pressure on ourselves and um i think i don't know it if we can just let some of that go learn how to live in contentment and focus on loving others learning to be loved man things could just fall into place that sounds so simplistic it's oversimplified but it's a great goal to shoot towards though thank you all for listening to the life plus god podcast and uh you can always check us out at tmumc.org slash podcast and don't forget to subscribe and uh, hey if you like what you're listening to leave a review give us some stars let us yeah. know uh what you think and and let's spread the word and get more people listening to this weird kooky podcast so kooky <laughs> <laughs>